Hello, and welcome to the Writers and Illustrators of the Future podcast. This is John Goodwin, your host. Today's guest is Writers of the Future judge, Dean Wesley Smith, who was also the very first winner to be presented an award 35 years ago when Writers of the Future Volume 1 was first released. Welcome, Dean. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So what I wanted to be able to, uh, to chat with you about mm-hmm. is... Your, your specialty is short fiction, mm-hmm. I, yeah, along I write with long of... fiction, along with poetry, along with poker, and along with... <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of everything, yeah. <laughs> but uh, when we were talking earlier, you talked about um, a desire to emulate some of the stuff that mm-hmm. Owen Hubbard did as, as mm-hmm. an author. And so that puts you in a special category of someone who's really familiar with the old pulp masters and how it applies now, and also how the, the cycle of pulp fiction to... Um, the slicks back then. Yeah. The, the world is always coming around. Everything goes around and comes around. That old cliche yeah. is really accurate in publishing. When you want to see the future of publishing, look at the history. And we are in that history right now. We are in the new pulp era of publishing. It's electronic rights now and the indie movement and everything else. But uh, um, that period from the late 1800s, 1890 and 90-something, when the pulps sort of started mm-hmm. with All Story and some of those others, and then, um, um, and then really blossomed in the 20s, 1920s. Um, and that period from the 1920s to the mid-1950s was just a heyday for incredible writing, and um, a lot of it, a lot of it. Yeah. And the writers who made their living in the pulps, um, writing for commercial um, for the audience, for the, the masses, the, you know, the f- people who really loved good fiction and good story more than anything else, good story. Um, they, they were prolific. They had a work ethic. Um, and everything about them I, I really have loved studying. And Hubbard was one of the masters of that period of time, as well as um, um, Lester Dent, which was actually mm-hmm. one of the pen names for Fanthorpe and, and a couple of the others. Um, they were just... They were amazing writers, just amazing writers. So, now, now you've also spanned multiple genres in your mm-hmm. in your career, as did Hubbard. So, talk about that, like the the need or the significance of being able to write effectively in all the genres. Yeah, I th- I think it's a, a key in this. It was a key in the pulp era. There were writers who stayed in one thing, you sure. know, like, like uh, Lester Dent wrote Doc Savage. Um, but there were a lot of writers, although he broke around quite a bit too. Um, there were a lot of writers in that period who just loved to write stories and they would find out, you know, what had openings or what new magazine was starting, or they'd talk to an editor and, and they'd say, I'm starting a new ranch romance stories or something like that, you know, which was the longest running pulp was ranch romances. I am really? not kidding you. It was the longest running pulp. Um, and, uh, it just was. It was. Um, it's advantageous as a writer to to sell a lot of uh, to have a lot of different markets, and if you enjoy reading across genres, mm-hmm. um, you know I wouldn't suggest a writer ever try to write something they don't like. Right. Um, you know I'm I'm. For example, I I have my weaknesses. One of which is is the Regency period of romance. I just I could never write it. I don't even understand it sometimes, um, but pretty much else I write across the board, you know. And Hubbard did too. He he often would you know um, just actually pick a where who was paying the most money, and that's why how he ended up in science fiction a lot was mm-hmm. was um, the different they were paying more than some of the westerns and some of the detective things that he was writing for. And, but I write a, a detective series. I write. Uh, I'm high tech space opera. I write time travel. I am all over the planet. I write a lot of fantasy. Yeah, you know, a lot of stuff like that. So now, there's um, the idea of writing fast and having. You know, we talked about mm-hmm. this just a little bit ago on the being able to submit something first draft. Mm-hmm. You know, just that's write what, it and send it out. That's what all the pulp writers did. Um, and one of them, the famous quote was, "They don't pay me to rewrite something." You, you wrote it once, you wrote it clean. Um, you wrote it to the best of your ability, and then you turned it in. And that's what writers should do now. They should write it once, they should write it clean, they should write it to the absolute best of their ability in that one, and then be done with it and move on to the next story. Um, the old pulp writers 
are were very very good at that. Um, they you know they got paid anywhere from a penny a word and on up. I mean Hubbard was one of the top writers. He got paid quite a bit more than that. Um, but um, um, you know they, they basically just they had to write a lot of words to make mm-hmm. a lot of money. And but through the Depression era and stuff like that, a penny a word, two cents a word. They were making fifty to a hundred thousand dollars in the depression, where a loaf of bread was five cents, and you know yeah. you could buy a car for a hundred dollars. You know they were they were really really very rich, very very rich. And then of course the booming Hollywood industry went to the novelists, and they took a lot of the work out of the magazines and a lot of that for the booming the new growing Hollywood world. Um, so, got it. Now on. Um, the analogy of your first draft or just writing like that mm-hmm. being all those nice little um, points coming out of your rock and the different edges and stuff like that. And oh, then when, you, when you go to polish it, rewrite it, get polishing. Yeah, well, yeah, that analogy is it does help uh, in a visualization. Is that when you find a beautiful, like a beautiful rock on the beach or something like that, it has sharp points and it has, you know, little facets in it and it has all kinds of colors and everything else in it. And it's unique. It is a... A uh, rock that is one of a kind, and that's the kind of thing you know you like that. But then, if you take that exact same rock and throw it in a rock polisher and let it you know polish, it will come out looking like every other polished rock. It'll have colors. It'll be nice and smooth. It'll be, and I said that's what rewriting does to stories. If you do the best you can, make it clean, don't write sloppy, and be done in, after one draft. You have that very unique thing that has your voice in it as an author, that has the character voice, that has some sharp edges. It may have a few imperfections. That's all good. That's what makes the story unique and mm-hmm. makes it your story. But if you polish it and rewrite it to death, it just becomes like a polished rock and it looks just like everything else. And those don't sell. What sells is that unique, very different rock. And that's why the, the pulp writers that were, are still being published to this day. I mean, you know, we still see, you know, the Perry Masons and the, and the Doc Savages and, and all of that stuff is still to this day out there on yeah, the stands. We have, we have pretty, Burles. yeah, we have a great success with, yeah, we, we released the Stories from the Golden Age, which yep. is 153 stories in 80 books. Wow. But I'm just curious, are there any, um, do you remember any particular stories that are, that stand out for you from, uh, from Elrond Hubbard? Oh, put me on the spot here. Um, typewriter. Typewriter in the Sky. That one, for some reason, I don't know why that story has always stuck with me. I mean, I don't, I realize I read so many stories because I still edit for Pulp uh-huh. House and, and other things, um, as well as writing my own. And I read a lot for workshops and my students that, through our workshops at WMG. Um, I, I basically don't retain story very much. But for some reason, Typewriter is one of those stories that is just, I, I think I probably have 10 stories in my whole life that have really stuck with me uh, through the years. And uh, Typewriter's one of them. Um, and it's, it's Mike just, Resnick's favorite story that, that yeah, Hubbard wrote. Yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things where, I don't know if it's my favorite story, but it is the story that, that um, I, you know, when you ask me that question, and it's like, yeah, that one. Uh, it's just, it's there. I've reread it numbers and numbers of times. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say Battlefield Earth, um, a, a lot because you guys initially at one point yeah. were, had, was going to have me write something on it. Yeah. And um, um, I, I love that novel. Um, I think that novel needs to be expanded. Not what Hubbard did, but the world, right. you know, the, yeah. the aliens invading and all the other stuff. So I would say of the two things, the short fiction, well, typewriter was short. It wasn't that long. The novella. Sort, yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah, novella length, barely, um, if I remember right. But uh, um, Battlefield Earth Two, you know, I think I think that one is the the one that really also strikes me, and and I've reread numbers of times, mm-hmm. numbers and numbers of times. Yeah, so. Will Ten, um, Phil Phil Class mm-hmm. taught typewriter in the sky in his class at Penn State. Oh, okay. right. He used yeah. that book. That was his favorite story as well. It, it just has a, it has a, a, a structure to it. That well, worked, yeah, Mike yeah. called it recursive. Yeah. Recursive science fiction. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Yeah, uh, Barry Malzberg is the the king of recursive science fiction. But uh, um, yeah, typewriters the, the, the classic. It, I, I don't know. I just always go to that. And and of and I'm fairly certain if I remember the story right, it didn't take him very long to write that. It was a one draft, right? Night or so. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I think he he sold ninety so percent of his stuff first draft for submission. Yeah, I, I tend to. Uh, study how people write. I think for writers in this modern world, if you go back and study how writers write, get past the, the silliness that, you know, that writers will tell people in public, like, you know, like Hemingway telling people that he does 60 drafts when you know he was a newspaper writer and he only did one draft. He never rewrote anything. Um, you know, but, but he, you know, would just jerk young writers around. I don't believe in doing that. I believe that you need to get through the core as to how writers really write and, 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 find out what they're doing so that it'll help you and realize that what you're doing is fun. And if you're having fun with your writing, you know, which clearly, you know, a lot of these pulp writers were having fun. They were making a living and trying to get by, but, but they were also writing great fun stories. They were, they were focused on story, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and when you go back to that classic story, movement and action and characters and good characters and story, um, you tend to, it tends to be universal even to today. Yeah, I think that's a very good point because that was post-World War I, pre-World War II, mm -hmm. right in the middle of the Depression. Half the mm -hmm. people were out of work and the other half were worried about being able to have a job still. Yeah. So they needed to be a story escape. to just escape to another whatever, and they, they didn't want a bad ending. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and their life was a bad ending. Yeah, and that's, you know, science fiction used to be the good guys won. Um, fantasy used to be good triumphed over evil mm -hmm. you know now it, it now it's not always that way in the endings but uh the the stories that are popular that last a long time like star trek you know star trek is good guys always win yeah you know and so it's just one of those things where that's why it's been going on since the 60s and is one of the iconic you know um basically stories that are continuing on and still with the new star trek out there now they've kind of reverted finally back to the star trek where the good guys win again and uh, and it's really nice to see i'm actually watching it again and uh, so and i'm a star yeah. trek writer so i mean I just there you go yeah. back in your room yeah and that's also why battlefield earth is 100 so popular too good guys it, win it definitely good guys win yeah i don't think he Hubbard wrote anything where the good guys didn't win that i remember no it's he was in that there's there's a story where he do, he told a story about revenge and revenge is definitely bitter you know oh yeah it was a wet one of his westerns and something there was like whoa but he was yeah, definitely well, revenge was a western trope yeah yeah that's a that's an automatic western trope you, yeah you, you, you know you somebody's killed and you got to go get revenge on the bad guy yeah and telling it from that perspective yes it would be but see that's still winning your yeah. viewpoint character is still winning in the end. And yeah. that's, that's, that, that really helps readers. Readers love that. And, yeah. and, and so many newer writers and writers of this era forget that early on. They're writing this dystopian type of stuff. And it's like, no, the good guys win. You know? I'm, I'm definitely that mindset. And Writers of the Future has that mindset. All the judges mm -hmm. are pretty much of that same, you know, mm -hmm. mindset that, you know, the story's got to be middle school on up, so it's it, we ought to make exclude certain things, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, even though it's open to all types of science fiction, fantasy, alternate history, horror, whatever like that, but it's got it's got to have that like an uptick at the end of the story. Yep, yep. it's got to have that feel good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, the the judges and writers of the future. That's one thing. I mentioned to my wife, you know, Christine Catherine yeah. Rush, um, on the phone, as is, is I've said, I'm, I'm with all of a lot of our old friends here. And, and so I actually did a little blog last night about, you know, I'm down here with, and I listed some of the names and got a number of letters back this morning saying, wow, you get to be with all those people. And I'm like, yeah, this is writers of the future. They bring in the top, top writers from around the science fiction and fantasy genres. And, uh, and they're all here trying to help the young writers who are winners in the contest. It's, it's, if you're not submitting out there to Writers of the Future, you need to be. Don't miss a deadline. You know, plus, the deadline's really good. I think it's one of the most valuable things to Writers of the Future is that deadline, as we were talking you with, know, Preston, early, yeah. Yeah, with Preston earlier about how he hit that deadline. It forced him to write. Every three months, he got something in. That was Kevin Anderson's thing. That was his biggest takeaway from the contest. Yeah, and I would, I would have never been in the first book. If, if I hadn't had that deadline 
and to hit it that day, you know. So, and I did the pulp writer thing. I pulled up a typewriter and banged out a story for a deadline. You know, I felt I felt really pulp writerish at that moment in time, <laughs> and it worked. Were. My Absolutely. story's still in print in thirty five years. So, yeah, great. Well, thank you very much. You it's bet. been great speaking with you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I hope uh, the writers out there study the old writers. You can learn a lot. Great. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for our next show. Subscribe to the Writers of the Future podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Writers and Illustrators of the Future are contests created by Elrond Hubbard to provide a means for the aspiring writer and artist to be seen and acknowledged. It is free to enter and open to new and amateur short story writers and artists of science fiction or fantasy. <laughs>